Hey, Nathan, welcome to the His and Her Money Show. Talad, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. So glad to have you here because, I mean, you've done some incredible things in your life, and now you're teaching others how to do some incredible things in theirs. And so we were glad that you were able to make some time to come by the show and share your wealth of knowledge with us today. But before we get into that, can you just take a moment and say hello to everyone that's tuned in and let them know what you're all about? Well, I have to tell you, Talat and Ty, both of you guys are drinking something very special because I have not figured out the whole relationship thing. I'm a killer in business and I'm great with money. But when it comes to relationships, holy moly, I'm waiting until 35 to even think about it. I'm 29 now, so I got six years to learn from you guys, okay? All right, all right. We'll see what we can do. (laughs) So, yeah, I mean, quick 60-second overview. First off, it's so nice connecting with you both and your audience. You know, money literacy is something that's not taught, so you guys are doing such a service. For me, I was architecture at Virginia Tech, you know, back in 2011. So it was eight years ago when I was, you know, 20 years old. And it taught, I quickly realized there was no money in architecture. I mean, zero. And so the last thing I was going to do is study five years in school, be in student debt and not have a guaranteed job at the end. And I said, you know what? I better learn how to sell and make money. And I quickly learned how to make money. And then I learned, wow, you know, what's more powerful learning how to keep it. And so I've spent a lot of time figuring out how to keep money and doing many, many things, whether it's launching my own podcast, The Top Entrepreneurs, we just passed 10 million downloads, or getting a book deal with Random House, or we have a linear TV show coming out soon. Um, I'm, I'm, my day job really is I spend a lot of time building and selling software companies. That's my number one source of income. And then I put that into a bunch of different, a bunch of d- different diversified asset classes to make sure I keep the money and it grows for me. Where did that mindset come from, though? Because you found it at a young age and you talked about how I better figure out how to make money and I better figure out how to manage money. Like young people, I when I was a teenager, when I was in my twenties, <laughs> bro, that was not <laughs> how, on how old are my how mind. old are you now? Thirty eight. And what were you doing when you were twenty, twenty one? Uh, I was young in the military, wasting every dime that came in. Well, thank, hey, thank you for your service. I think that's wonderful. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I'll tell you, do you. Now, do you and Ty have kids? Three, nine, seven, and five years old. Okay, so that's special. I, I hope you guys are planning in the future to talk even more about how you're raising them to be smart with money. Absolutely, I, the conversations have already begun. Yeah, I mean, so like I always look back and I try and identify. Now hindsight's twenty twenty, but I try and figure out is there something my parents did to help raise an entrepreneur. And, you know, it's hard to look back, but I'll tell you one thing I always remembered when I was little. I mean, I was talking like five, six years old, all the way up through when I left for college. Um, they would never really tell me no. In other words, if I ask some, ask them something, let's do something like like a really stupid example. Mom, dad, can I touch the stove? And the stove is on. They, they wouldn't actually say, no, don't touch the stove. They would say, Nathan, you think, you know, you do what's best, you know, you, you decide. And right. And so I'd move my hand closer and I'd maybe get burned or I'd feel the heat and not touch it. But the point is like, they let me learn those lessons. So they never really said no. They always actually replied with a choice. And so a real example of this versus a funny, silly one is if I want to have a sleepover with my friends in high school, they'd say, well, Nathan, if you have your friends over Friday night, then we can't take the family out to the movies on Sunday night, which, which would you decide, you know, what do you want to decide to do? And so I, this whole like idea of give and take, right, I think is really critical. And it ha- that has to do with money as well. If you spend a dollar today, you don't have a dollar tomorrow. If you save a dollar today, you maybe have a dollar 10 tomorrow if you figure out how to do good things with it. So mm-hmm. I think that's what my parents did to help me think like this. Um, and I'm, I'm curious too, by the way, if you see these same patterns with the, the way you guys are raising your kids. Absolutely. We teach them the value of a dollar. They all have bank accounts. They all, when they get money, they go and make deposits with us. They know how to give. You know, we are big in church, so they give, they save, and we take them to the store to spend some of it so they know that their money should go in three different directions and not just one, which was what I was doing. <laughs> yeah. And now here's a big question. Allowance or no allowance? So that is it's currently no allowance and it is a hotly contested debate <laughs> in the McNeely household as to will there be allowance implemented or not? It's tricky. It's you know, I look back and I'm being very judgmental here, but I look back at my friends who I know in high school, I was always so jealous that they were getting these allowances because I lived in Loudoun County. It was a well, that's a wealthy County in the U S I, mean, I think actually was one of the wealthiest ranked, but they were getting these massive allowances and I would always be jealous. Mom, dad, why don't I get an allowance? And my parents never gave me an allowance. And I'll tell you all those kids that got big allowances today, when I look at what they're doing, 
I mean, I won't speak badly about what they're doing, but let's just say I see them do things that at least on the, they appear to not be smart financial decisions. So there's, I think there's something to be said uh, for the whole allowance, no allowance thing when you're very young. Yeah. And speaking of doing things very young, I mean, you launched a brilliant company at the young age of 19 years old, and you eventually ended up selling that very business for $10 million. Can you uh, yeah. talk to us about that journey? Like, how do you start? Like, why do you? Why did you even have the thought to start a company at 19 years old? I mean, that takes guts. That takes guts at 29, 39, 49. You did it at 19. But so, and, so I, I think it yeah. takes bigger guts to stay in school and get started with debt and then try and then try and figure out how to get out of it. I actually think it's gutsier to do that than it is to do, launch your own company and drop out. My my opinion. Yeah, no, break that down. I love I love the thought line. Yeah, I, I just saw a lot of risk with that path. I you know I I'm a guy that's I'm like, I'm actually really lazy as an entrepreneur. I think most entrepreneurs are, by the way. The reason they're successful is because they find the laziest and quickest and easiest way to do something so they can go back to being lazy as fast as possible, right? <laughs> so the idea of graduating with potentially no job and a lot of debt, I'm thinking I'm going to have to work really hard to get rid of this debt. That I can't be lazy. Now, if I figure out how to drive sales today and take control of my own destiny, that's way different. So, yeah, I mean, you mentioned numbers, and look, I don't say this stuff to brag, but in the era of fake news, I think numbers are critical because they don't lie. And so whenever you can support your kind of story with facts and numbers, I do it. So my publisher wasn't happy about this, but you can see here in the book on page six, this is my tax return from 2013. And I'm 29 today, and we're recording this here in 2019, right? So that would have been when I was six, six years ago. So I was 23 years old. And that was the first year we hit a million in top line sales. And to lot, it was the first year where my 38th employee I hired was my ex-professor from the year before. Wow. So I love the fact that I was hiring, right? That's the ultimate, like... <laughs> Boom, it's a new system. You're hiring people who were teaching you and giving you grades the year before. So it was um it didn't seem risky to me at the time. It, it felt like actually the less risky path. So let's talk about that, the less risky path, because most people that are tuned into the show are nine to fivers and maybe they have entrepreneurial ambitions. Maybe they don't. Um, why is entrepreneurship something that people should really be taking a hard look at and not lock themselves into just simply uh, a nine to five job. Yeah. Well, can I ask you kind of a personal financial question? Sure. I don't know what it costs to raise three kids, mm -hmm. but on average, what would you say you guys have to spend kind of per month to support all the kiddos? Wow. That's a good question. Um, when you consider food, I mean, our food costs went up, um, they're in public school, so we're not paying private tuition and we are careful with, um, how many like extracurricular activities and stuff that they do? Okay, I mean, so food, clothes, extracurriculars. If you include in, it, it's hard for me to quantify if I'm just parsing their expenses out of our overall household expenses. Um, let's just say safely because my wife finds every deal that she can. She's a pro at it. Uh, let's Smart go, woman. Let's go. Let's go a thousand. Yeah. Okay. Per and per kid or for all three? Uh, for all three, because okay. Yeah, because she's kind of skilled. <laughs> and are you? I was gonna say now, when they were younger, was it mm -hmm. higher because you had to pay child care and you guys are both working or no? We, or when we, we stay at home? Pay, we only play pay child child care for the first one when we were uh, pregnant with number two. My wife came home, so we saved on that. But I mean, that's the big kicker for most families is child care, especially yep. where we are. I mean, you can pay. Chicago, right? Eight, right. You, you can pay $800 a month for one child. Yep. This is why I bring this up, right, is, is everyone's personal situation is unique. So some of your listeners right now are listening going, well, Nathan, of course it wasn't risky for you. You were a college student. You had no family, no car payment, no house payment, no kids to raise, right? And, and I think w what I would tell them is, yes, you're in a different mindset, but the last thing you'd ever want to do is have your kids five or 10 years from now hear you you know, in an interview or, or reading a blog post that you wrote that the reason you didn't start your own business or take control of your own finances was because of the kids, right? You're essentially using them as an excuse. Uh, it, it, I, I just, I, I don't recommend that. 
I will acknowledge it is tougher because your fixed expenses monthly are higher. So um, what I would tell most people that are listening to this working a nine to five with two or three kids is, you know, the first thing is making sure, and you guys preach this, I've heard you preach it, you gotta keep your expenses lower than your income. And the only two levers you have to build wealth are two, how much money you make and how much you keep. Those are the only two things that you can do to change the delta between those, right? And then with what you keep, you can decide what you do with it, right? Put it in church, put it towards a vacation, whatever you want to do with it. Um, so if you feel like you're listening right now and you can't control how much more money you make, you feel like you've topped out, which by the way, I'd push you on. I bet you could accomplish more. But let's say you feel like you've topped out. You got to think about how can you cut costs. And so there are a lot of things in this book that I talk about in terms of how to cut costs or make money off things that you already own. Like on page 96, I give the audience three websites that you, anyone listening can use that will pay you for your car while you're not using it. So your car is a fixed asset you pay money for a monthly payment on called 100, 200 bucks a month. They'll essentially pay you 100, 200 bucks a day because what they're doing it is essentially licensing it to a Uber driver or someone like this, and they're making money on it. You're turning a liability into an asset and cash flow. And so there are dozens of ways for families to do that and, and keep and make more money at the same time. When I was reading your book, which is great, by the way, highly recommend everybody. Tell you read it, it by the way. People, you know, people, the podcast, you know, sometimes they people come on and you're like, they haven't read the damn book. And you're like, come on, what's going on here? <laughs> nope. I read it. Loved it. You enjoyed it? it? Absolutely. Uh, Good. Tons of, of ideas that I had never heard previously. And I read a lot. So you did a good job of uh, some eye opening information in there. One of the things that stood out to me when you were in a, uh, you were talking about budding entrepreneurs and people that have ambitions and they have ideas and desires to start something. But you said in a lot of cases, they get paralyzed by the enormity of the process or the enormity of the idea or the concept and they end up doing nothing. Can you mm -hmm. kind of unpack how that works? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think people understand the problem because you guys are probably, many of you guys maybe have a little ideas. I know myself, I have little Apple notes. Tell out, I'm curious if you guys have this two little Apple notes and anytime I have an idea, I just jot it down in that real quick. I and use my, uh, my notes app on my phone. There you all go. All right? the time. How many ideas you got? Probably hundreds, oh, right? Oh my goodness. I, I couldn't count them. <laughs> it's, it's annoying actually. Yeah. So you dump them all there so that you, you, you get them out of your mind. And the reason people don't actually ever make time to go execute them is for what you just said. So one of the things that I, I sh literally show in the book um, is I give people permission to copy your competitors. A lot of people feel like this is unethical or not right. But what they really don't realize is almost everything in life, there are really no brand new ideas. Unless you're a billionaire like Elon Musk and you're trying to invent how to live on Mars. That's different. But for everyone else, most ideas are gonna be replicas of something else. And the way you win is by out executing. So the way you should start is by copying really quickly, really fast and unapologetically copy your competitors. And once you copy it exactly, add your own twist. That's actually the, the quickest way to jumpstart these ideas you have that you haven't moved on yet. Great ideas. Great, great. I mean, uh, I believe it was Tony Robbins that said the best way to achieve success is to find someone who's successful at what you've done and do what they did. And yep. I think a lot of times we overcomplicate the process and we think well, it's been done. There's no room for us. You know, if I come out with this, they, you know, it's already in the market, but it's already in the market for certain people. Everybody hasn't seen uh, guru number one. So you can be guru number two. So I think what you're saying is 100 percent accurate. Or add your, I mean, or add your own twist. Like, let me give you an example for what, for, for anyone listening. Um, actually, let me ask you, how much of your audience would you, would you say are kind of doing their own thing? They have their own blog or their own little side project. I would say they are in the minority. I think, okay, I think a lot of people have ideas that they have not enacted. Yep. Okay. Very good. So this is helpful. So he, I'll give them all a little tactic, right? If they want to work like for 20 minutes tonight on a thing, um, there, there is copy that I developed where basically actually I'm going to lose it for your show. You guys are always read the, the things on entrepreneur or Forbes or fortune where it's like top 50 money and investing podcasts, right? Yes. And I'm sure you've been mentioned on some, but maybe you're like number 15 or 16. And you know, if you get up to number one, you'll get way more traffic. Well, there are ways that you can, let's just say someone listening right now is working nine to five, has an idea in the soap space. 
they could go search top soap brands in Google, find the number one blog post in that world, and then follow my script on page 214 in the book to reach out to that writer and get their product listed at the top of old articles that get a lot of SEO traffic. And so this is like the only playbook I ran on one of my past companies. And frankly, it's actually what I did on my podcast to, to get 10 million downloads. And, you know, I put, you know, we just closed, we closed, you know, many $180,000 sponsor deals for the podcast every year. I put those in the book, but it's just from that one tactic. So these are, you copy, right? And then you out SEO and then you add your own flavor and your twist for you guys. It's your, your power couple and money and investing with three kids. And most people listening relate to you. They probably have one, two, three kids and they're just like you. So um, it's important to follow those steps. For people who are like, okay, they heard your advice. They're like, they're writing notes. They're like, okay, let me, uh, let me figure out how I can do the version of this for myself. For yep. people that like, we mentioned, we, we described a demographic. Um, they have a job, they have a family. How do you know when to like do everything bootstrapping on your own versus the outsourcing piece? Because you mentioned like in the last example you gave, out SEO. Like the first time I tried to learn SEO, it was like I felt like I was attempting to learn Chinese. And it you felt are. overwhelming. <laughs> and it Mandarin. was like when you when you feel that overwhelmed, sometimes it just you just say, forget it. Mm-hmm. And maybe that's something you should outsource, or maybe that's something you should figure out. When you're when you're wrestling with that uh, mindset, how do you coach um, new entrepreneurs or young entrepreneurs um, how to answer that question? About learning new skills? About deciding whether to like buckle down and learn this yourself like this part of your business yourself because you're trying to conserve maybe capital or investing in this to speed up your process of getting your business idea off the ground so i think there's a basic kind of like reading and writing and these things there's a basic level of skills you have to have really to be dangerous but then you know if you want to scale and build a business right that can run without you you have to replace yourself so a good example from for me of this is look when i sold heyo um i turned down the job offer to go work for the company that bought me and i was basically out on my own and i said what am i going to do so i launched the podcast and i taught myself how to do my own audio editing in a tool called audacity do you guys do your own editing uh, we did probably the first 80 episodes and we did use Audacity. <laughs> okay, good. And what happened? What broke after the 80th episode? Well, I almost broke because <laughs> <laughs> I was so like tedious Amen and taking that. out every little um and ah. And it was just like, you know what? Uh, let me find somebody else to do this before I drive myself crazy. So that I think that's exactly how it should work, right? For things like this, if you do it yourself, you then know how to replace yourself. So I had the same experience. My show's 15 minutes every day with a new CEO, and I was editing and recording and like doing everything for my own shows. And each episode took me like three or four hours to edit. It's a 15 minute show. And then what I learned is I built this system where I basically took my process, I documented it, and then gave it to five people on Fiverr and paid them each five to $10 to run the process. And whoever ran the process the best, whoever gave me back the best edited episode, I hired to do every episode for five bucks, which saved me an hour of time, right? Or three hours. And I knew my time was worth more than that. So I went through this exact progression uh, in the book. This is on page 41, but you see, I actually outlined the system of how I got the per episodic fees for editing down to 29 bucks with the whole system and the scripts I used to find the freelancers to do these things. So to your audience, it's critical you understand some basic stuff about your business, but as quickly as possible, you want to pre-sell whatever it is you're building so you have a little capital. I'm talking like 100 or 300 or 500 bucks to then start hiring someone else as little as five or 10 bucks a process to replace yourself. What are some mistakes that you see entrepreneurs making? Because you've done it successfully. You know entrepreneurs. You've coached entrepreneurs. When trying to get your concept into a viable, profitable business, what are some mistakes that people are making and how can we avoid them? Well, so a lot of times people, okay, let, let me do, let me go two things here. A lot of people in my world will raise capital from friends, family, and VCs, and they end up spending too much. They increase what's called their burn rate by too much, and they never can get ahead because they're spending as much as they're making. I, I'm way more interested in someone that makes $100 a month, but has figured out some way to keep their expenses to 10 bucks because the Delta is 90. That's, to me, that's more impressive than someone that makes a hundred grand a month, right? And, you know, and only keeps a dollar. 
right? That means they're, they're spending everything. There's nothing left. So the, like how much you're saving is critical. And so keeping your expenses really low are critical. And so, I mean, I, I do this now to lead as a game. Did you see the part of the book where I negotiated the the hotel, the luxurious hotel stays for free? Uh, yeah. I mean, I saw that. I saw the plane. Yes. <laughs> travel. I'm like, wait, what? Like, where, how did I miss all of this stuff? How crazy is it? And by the way, you guys are bigger on Instagram than I am. Like a lot of people think you have to be like Kim Kardashian to get like a free, you know, free five days in a luxurious five star Bali resort. Dude, I did it with 5000 Instagram followers. It's just my copy. This email I sent the resorts was really strategically written. And you guys can do the same thing. I saved to it. I added up the retail of everything I saved. It was about 30 grand in First class flight tickets, hotel stays, free food, massages, everything. I felt so unaccomplished after reading that <laughs> stuff. I was like, what, a, what a, why am I here? Like, what, why did I miss all of this stuff? So trust and well, believe that some of that stuff, uh, we're, we're lining up and we're going to try it. Yeah. I was going to say, here's, here's that. This was, this was to Asia. I was on a little Hello Kitty flight for your audience. I looked real cute in those Hello Kitty socks, but, um, I mean, it it works. And what's funny is like the, the, the reason I wrote this book is like people think that they can't do it. And I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to put stinking screenshots in this book. So it's crystal clear and sleep. My, my publisher really hates it. You know, I'm with Random House Portfolio, one of the biggest publishers. And the reason they hate it or don't like it, I should say, is because it's not a timeless book. It won't sell in 10 years. It won't be valuable because these things all worked for me like yesterday. Mm -hmm. And so the first people that buy the book have the biggest advantage. And as it gets older, it gets less valuable. So again, the publisher didn't like it, but I thought being urgent and practical was more important than being timeless. Imagine a life where your money isn't strangled by mortgage payments. Imagine what you could do when you don't have to send them money that you work so hard for. Come get simple, powerful, and real solutions to eliminating monthly mortgage payments forever. America's number one money couple presents Crush My Mortgage. In this exclusive course, you will be equipped with strategies to help you move faster toward the promised land of owning your house free and clear. Learn strategies to help you in the areas of payment acceleration, extra income generation, and wealth creation, all to help you crush your mortgage. Visit crushmymortgage.com and get started today. Join us on the path to power, freedom, and legacy. That's crushmymortgage.com. Another thing that you talk about, teach on, is passive income. And I think that I just there's so many different variations of what passive income is. I'm curious um, for you, when you talk about passive income, what are you what are you saying? What do you mean? And again, why is this something that should be a target of ours, no matter yep. where we are in our life? Well, passive income, I think a lot of people think about it like it's this mystical unicorn hopping through their backyard that they can't seem to catch, right? Like everyone else has passive income. Why don't I? What, what is this? And then what happens is they feel bad about it. So they start saying, I have passive income, but they actually they actually are really aware that that passive income takes up the majority of their time. So it's not actually passive income. Actual passive income is money that comes to you no matter what. It just happens. In fact, I have this thing. You can, I'm going to reach over here to my desk. These are just like – these are like – I put them in a little binder clip here. You can see them. And it's just a bunch of checks. And these are little like royalty checks. You can see here this one – is from a lady named Ming. I invested $3,000 in her food truck like a year ago, helped her grow the business, and she now pays me 10 cents per meal she sells in perpetuity. Now, this is only an 825 per month check, but I'm going to get that for the rest of my life because I helped her build her business. So, you know, that's an example, but I know a lot of your audience might not have three grand, right, to just invest in a random business and do that. So the way to, you know, some other examples of how I created passive income when I like before I had sold my company, before I had wealth, is some of the real estate stuff. Now, have you and Ty gotten in real estate yet? So we attempted, our first attempt was 2008. And okay, and what happened? happened the stock, the, the market What crashed. was it pre, okay, it was pre-crash or post-crash? Yep. So we, uh, it was pre-crash, we bought it and fixed it up and we put it back on the market to flip right when everything went haywire. Okay, so and what so, happened? Uh, we held on to it for an extra year. Um, then we wanted to, 
and we have been gun shy ever since. But now, 2019, we are getting back into it. Prior to that, um, as our audience knows, our focus was solely on paying off our primary residents, and we did that. So now the next target is to jump back into real estate investment-wise. That- that, I mean, that, that that's great. Um, and I would tell you too, I think assets right now are overpriced. I think we're about to see another crash here very soon. So I would just say, you know, the, what I'm doing right now personally is I'm actually hoarding cash and I'm waiting for the next downturn to then buy a bunch of stuff. Smart. Um, yeah, but, but like, I'll show you guys a picture because this was in Blacksburg, Virginia. This was my first kind of place that I bought in Blacksburg, Virginia. And this was back in 2011. So I would, I was, I guess about 20 at the time, 21. So this was before, I mean, this was right out of my dorm room basically. And so I bought this thing. It was for 328,000 bucks. And now today, right, the rental income is 2,400 bucks, right? My expenses are about 1,600. So it's making me, and it has made me for the past five or six years, just 800 bucks a month. And it's literally a check. I don't spend any time on it. Broken toilets, landscaping, that all goes to my property management company that I pay 6% of the rents to. So it really is passive income. And I only put up $10,000 to secure that asset because I did an FHA loan. I lived in it for a little bit to get the price really cheap. Mm -hmm. So uh, I walk through what all those terms mean in the book on page 145. But I just the idea of thinking about how can I buy assets today that will pay me for life whether you only have a thousand in savings or a hundred thousand in savings, anybody can do this if you get creative. That is a really powerful form of thinking. That's what I wanted to touch on next because this is, this takes a mindset shift because we are programmed to go to college, to launch a career, to work there 40 years, and retire at 65. Mm-hmm. That is what you're supposed to do. Yep. You are challenging all of that, all of that from the beginning of your book to the end of your book and, and to your own platform where you teach this um, every day. Whew, how can we, those that are, are, are used to the way that we've been taught, whether that's uh, going to work every day or whether you're in college right now, and some of us are at work every day and in grad school at night because we're still... Yep in the process that we've been taught how i think it's easier said than done to embrace i mean you you are absolutely right you've proven that all this can be done you have what we call receipts like you literally have receipts in your book i have a pile of them right (laughs) showing (laughs) us like i did this you can do it too you've given us links and websites in the book and screenshots but still it's like it's hard to break what's on what's going on in between your ears how do you help people with their mindset mind set shifts in order to embrace this ability to generate passive income, to pursue entrepreneurship, to pursue your own, to make uh, your liabilities into assets like you talked about earlier. Yeah, well, I subscribe to the following belief, which is most people become what they imagine the most. Whatever they're telling themselves, they're imagining the most for themselves. That's what they become. The problem is most people have very small imaginations. So they get small results. And now I know, and I want to address this because I think it's important. I was a white male born in North America. I never was poor. I never had to worry when I was growing up about a shelter over my head or food on the table. I have made, I have, I had, that was a major advantage. And we need to do a lot of things in the country to make sure that everyone has that kind of advantage. So I want to address that and say, I'm so thankful and privileged to be there, but go back to my point, which is even if you're listening to this, and you are just having a crappy day and your bank's at zero or you're in debt or you're in a fight with your spouse or your kids or you don't know where your next paycheck is coming from, the, the, your ability to brainwash your own head is what will allow you to basically trip into getting lucky. I, I, and this has happened to me so many times. Let me give you an example. When I launched the podcast, I had no media experience to lead. I don't know if you guys did when you launched yours. Did you? Uh, my wife did. She had a platform okay. previously, and she had done some TV and stuff like that. Okay, so okay, so you you guys were ahead of me here, right? So I had no knowledge of how this stuff worked. So to get my first guest, I was like, "How do I do this?" So I was I was telling people, "Hey, will you?" I was begging them, "Will you come on my show? You'll be the first one." And no one replied. Why would they? They know it's a new show with no listeners. Until I changed one word. I said, "Will you come on my show? We will have a million downloads by the end of the summer." Mm. That's it. Even though I had nothing, I had nothing in that moment, zero, nothing. 
I felt like a huge con. But in my head, I'm like, Nathan, just keep saying it because it is true, right? You could hustle and you could actually hit a million. And I'm like, wow, if I just keep saying this, what happened was all the guests that I recorded, they then marketed their shows. And guess what? We had 2.3 million downloads by the end of the summer, right? And and so I, I don't know how else to say this besides it's just to have the courage to put these bold statements out. Tell them to your kids. Tell them to your coworkers. Tell them to your spouse, right? And that forces you to really go for them. And then also the universe has a way of helping you achieve these things. And so repeating that in between your ears is really important. And at the core of your book, you talk about the fact that there are four rules that we need to break in order to become rich. Can you tell us what those four rules are? When you were reading through these, were you going, oh, this is just another theory book, whatever, or, or were they resonating? Did you feel them hit? Did they no, hit you? Yeah, I, I could definitely feel it. And I came, I, I always come into books open minded. You have to be skeptical like, too. Like I, I like to embrace, you know, people's what, what they've learned through their through their own process. So I had an open mind, and so yeah, I definitely resonated with it. Yeah. Well, here's what's a little, in my opinion, unfair about what's happening in the world right now. As wealth continues to be um, look, and by the way, I'm probably in this category, right? Top 5%, right? As wealth continues to like get like, stuck on these people and the wealth distribution is messed up. The reason is because typically once people gain power or wealth, tell you true or false, do they want more people to compete with them with power and wealth or no? As they gain it? Um, no, no. Once I, they're there, once they're on their perch, do they want competitors trying to take their wealth and power oh, away? Absolutely not. So what's the best way to make sure no one can take your wealth or power? To hide the process. Exactly. Mm -hmm. exactly. You nailed it. Mm -hmm. Hide the process. Complicate the process. So that ladder that they climbed up, that wealthy person to get that success, once they're there, they'll start removing rungs below them, making sure it's impossible for anyone else to take the same path. And so what's happened is the wealth class of our world has taught us four things to live by, which are just false. And you have to break these rules if you want to go compete with the wealthy and become part of the 1%. So that first rule is the following. You never want to focus on one thing. There are so many best-selling books right now about focus on one, focus on one thing. But do you guys have – are there bridges in Chicago? Not really. No, yeah, because you guys are on the lake. But let's use a bridge analogy. Mm -hmm. If you were driving up along a you know, up to a bridge, and the bridge had a big red sign before you got on it, and said, "Hey, just so you guys know, um, if winds are higher than 30 miles per hour, this bridge only has a single point of failure. Right? It might break. You'd be less. You, you, I mean, you'd be. Like, I'm not driving over this bridge, right? Engineers when they engineer bridges, there's like seven or eight points of failure, eight or nine things that have to go wrong all at the same time for the bridge to collapse. And so bridges rarely collapse. So why do we build our lives around a single point of focus, one job, one employer, one paycheck? You are setting yourself up to be a bridge that crashes with very little things aligning. So by not focusing on one thing and having multiple things going, you're setting yourself up to be more diversified, more secure, and you never have one weak spot. And I think that's key. Mm -hmm. I think I think that's, um, again, it's the way we're trained, like from, from, I mean, even going back to allowance, you know what I mean? One source of income, you know? And yep. so I just think what you, you're, you're, you're sharing with us is probably for some a tough pill to swallow, but it's a pill that should be swallowed because I think now more than ever, there are so many ways to be diversified. There are so many avenues that you can take to not just have one source of income, to not be dependent. And that, you know, that's a big, at the heart of everything we teach, whether that's debt freedom, entrepreneurship, relational strength, it's to get your power back, to stop letting other people, other sources take the power away from you because we only get one life and we need to make the most of it that we can. It absolutely. I mean, so true. So that's rule number one. Don't focus on one thing. Number two is um, you have to copy. Don't invent new things. You have to copy things. You have to give yourself permission to be okay copying and then adding your own twist because that's how everything works. The people that are wealthy today, they copied one thing or another thing. Steve Jobs, like right pulled from the Xerox park to invent the iPhone. Uh, Facebook just copies everything Snapchat does, right? No one ever goes, oh, Mark, that's so mean of you. That's so bad. No, they go genius, smart, right? He's defending, he's serving the shareholders. 
shoulder. So you guys should copy too. Uh, number three, right, is you don't want to focus. Um, you don't want to focus on um, the hot opportunity in any space. You want to actually sell the pickaxes to the gold miners. Right. So if, if there's a hot space right now, you want to sell things that service that space, not the actual hot item. A lot of people get sucked up in whatever the hot thing is. That's a recipe for disaster because usually the hot thing is overvalued, if that makes sense. Yeah, 100 um, percent. And I think that even like when people ask us like, hey, how do you get started uh, investing in the stock market? You know, we have real simple, basic principles like go and invest in index funds. And it's like, that's exactly that's what it, I do. Right. Even but today, that, that's, that's, what what the, I do. that's what the wealthy do. But it's not it's not flashy enough. They want to go invest in Amazon. They want to go invest in Facebook because those are hot names. Yep. And so that goes along with what you were just saying. Yeah. Being rich is not sexy. That's why you get rich, because no one pays attention to you while you do it. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. I mean, my portfolio, if I open up my Vanguard today, I put a portion of every every dollar of income that comes in from my all, all these different channels, a portion of it goes to an index fund that just mirrors the S&P 500, mm -hmm. both domestically in the States, and then I do some emerging market and developing markets overseas. But it's boring stuff. Mm -hmm. and, so, and it's not uncomplicated, unlike what the gurus and the television networks and the magazines want you to think, that this is some complicated process that only certain people can help you figure out and you can't figure out for yourself. They have to convince you that it's complicated because that's the only way that they can then convince you to buy their magazine to solve the complication and figure it out, mm -hmm. right? They have to do that. Yeah. So yeah, I talked about the three rules and the last one is goals. Go you, goals are the most dangerous thing on earth. I will tell you why. Corporations spend trillions of dollars to get your heart and your mind and your body fighting for a goal. For example, Rolex will spend a million bucks on Roger Federer's wrist during Wimbledon, during a tennis match, because everyone watching will see the Rolex on his wrist and they'll say, goal, I want to spend 30 grand. I want a Rolex. Right. And they'll work towards that, then spend all their money the second they have it. What's way more powerful is to invest in the system not the goal. And so the system will then produce these goals almost by accident, automatically, if you build a good system. This is the difference between going after the, you know, the, the golden egg that the golden goose lays versus making and keeping the golden goose happy and healthy with a lot of energy. You want to invest in systems, not goals. I love that. I love that. I love that a lot. And Ooh, there's so much that, I, that that we can jump into because, I mean, <laughs> the way you, you wrote your book, I mean, there is so much there. And one of the things that was new for me, and again, I read a lot, I research a lot, especially in entrepreneurship, was, and you, and you even just had an example earlier in the episode, was that there are opportunities out there for, for anybody to invest in small businesses. Mm -hmm. That's just not an idea that I think is prominent enough. I, I, I didn't even really consider it in the way that you teach it until I read your book. I think that a lot of times when we think about investing in a business, we think about franchises, you know, yep. how can I get into this franchise, that franchise, or how can I start something on my own? So can you kind of talk to about, you know, the opportunities that are all around us for people like us to be investors into small businesses? Yeah. Well, Tali, I have to tell you, this was not some genius stroke of my imagination that I maniacally planned out. What happened was two or three years ago, I took my cell phone, I went on Facebook Live, and I took my checkbook, and I said, I'm going to walk down the street in Austin, Texas, and try and invest in or acquire a whole business on the spot. And so I let my audience tell me which food truck to walk up to, and they found the one called Yummy Ming's Thai Food. And so I did it. I walk up, I ordered a, a pad thai and I said, Ming, are you the founder? Are you the owner? She said, yes, yes. I said, well, tell me about how much you make. And she was making like five, six grand a month selling a thousand meals, blah, blah, blah. And then long story short is after 20 minutes, once I knew all of her metrics, I wrote her a $6,000 check because that allowed her to pay off the loan on the food truck. So she didn't have a $600 a month payment anymore. And the deal we made is she paid me back 75 cents per meal until I was paid back the six grand and then 10 cents per meal in perpetuity. So if I helped her double, triple, quadruple her business, I'd get this check every year for the rest of my, every month for the rest of my life. So she paid me back to elite in under 12 months. I got my money back. I helped her triple the business and now I get 10 cents per meal in perpetuity and 1.2 million people watched that Facebook live episode. It went viral. How crazy is that? Man. So how do we do it? Like how do we, you know, how do we spot an opportunity? How do we figure out like, oh, 
that might be something. Like, are yep. there are there resources or, or or platforms that we can go where maybe a buyer is selling, or is it something that we just have to keep an eye out for and investigate and pursue as what we see I, it? So yes, but what I would tell you is first create a little pot of money you're willing to risk. It could be as low as 500 bucks, let's or a thousand, whatever. You don't have to do six thousand like I did. Create a little pot and just think about where you guys like. Where do you guys must go? Probably to a lunch place after church every Sunday, I imagine, right? Where do you guys yeah, go after bre- church? Breakfast place is called. Um, it's a little breakfast like pancake house that we just okay. Our kids love and we love. Do you know the owners? <laughs> We know who they are. We see them. Have, we haven't had like a conversation with them. Yeah. So it's as simple as next time you're in there, inviting them over and saying, hey, we just love to meet you. We're here every weekend mm-hmm. and open up a casual conversation about, hey, like we love this business. You, you have such a positive impact on our family every day after church. We come here, we bond together as a family and it's so valuable. We'd love for you to be able to expand. Like if you had extra money, do you know what you would do with it to expand the front, you know, expand the business? Mm-hmm. And if they say yes, well, then you can start putting your deal making hat on saying, wow, if maybe if I gave them a grand, they could buy six more tables, increase how many people they can sit every Sunday, bring families closer together, and then basically negotiate how you get your money paid back. So everybody should start with a product or business that they love or go to or use every week. That's the best place to start. If someone's listening, has heard all of this great information that you've given us today, but they're still like they're stuck you know, mentally, they're like – Man, that that would be nice. I wish I could do that. They're just unsure if they have what it takes to do some of these things, make these things a, um, a reality for them. What words of encouragement would you offer to them? Uh, you will wake up tomorrow morning. It will be a new day. The only person you're going to wake up with is you. So no one's going to be judging you. Uh, it makes sense to take these risks. You've got one life to live. The, the more risks you take, the more swings at bat you take, the higher likelihood you have of hitting a home run or even a single or a double. So you got to swing the bat. Most people never even swing the bat because they're stuck in one single nine to five job where someone else has all their power and they're frankly being used. So that would be my words of encouragement is take a risk or two. And listen, you know, my, my mom hates how active I am on Twitter and Facebook, but message me. I mean, seriously, I have people on Facebook all the time where people are like, Hey, I try to do X it failed. How would you try it again? So I'm there for, I'm there for people. Now I can't do this with millions and millions of people. Right. But, um, I try and be as responsive to lead as possible to these kinds of questions. And I would love to do that with your audience. In fact, if you go to capitalistbook.com where they can get the book, there's a little chat in the bottom, right? I personally manage that on my phone so they can chat with me right now. If they go to capitalistbook.com and ask me questions, if they have questions about the show. Awesome. And tell everybody a little bit more about the book. And I'm assuming that that is where they should go and pick it up. But tell us all about it and how to get it and how to stay in touch with you on social media. Well, yeah. And and tell me real quick, too, because I know you are a huge, huge reader and you vet your guests hardcore. I know that about you guys. You know, a lot of podcasts will just take anybody. No, we're very protective of our audience. You're extremely protective. And we had no relationship at all except portfolio reaching out to you. So you are skeptical reading the book. What would you, I mean, if you had to give your audience one reason to pick it up and read it, cause it is 20 bucks, right? Mm-hmm. So it, it's not like it's free. Um, what would you recommend they go to in the book first? Well, the thing that I, the reason, the number one reason probably that I would recommend this book is because it is super practical. It is not a bunch, or it's not strictly philosophy and ideology, but there are so many examples of things that you can do right now, even if it's not from the sense of investing in a business. Like you, you talked about how to, if if you like, a lot of people are are trying to get out of debt listening to our show, or they're trying to hit some certain financial goals. So you give examples of things that they can do, like you talked about earlier with the car. Like your your car can be generating a couple hundred, a couple thousand dollars a month that can be helping you achieve these financial goals. So I would look at some of the ways the the tips that are kind of low hanging fruit for people to be able to start generating income with some of the things that they already have in their life. So I think that section of the book was super impactful. Yeah, that's good, guys. And that's page uh, that's that's page 91 to 110, uh, which uh, Tully's referencing. So, yeah, uh, I would love for you guys to obviously pick it up. Uh, it's capitalistbook.com. You can also just Google search Latka book, and I'm sure Talit uh, and Ty, they'll put it in the show notes as well. But most importantly, guys, I just want this, honestly. This is me reaching out my hand to you saying, grab my hand, let's go get coffee or lunch and brainstorm together. This is just like 
it's it's an excuse to start a relationship together. And I want to I want to be close with all you guys. And Talita, I want to stay close with you and Ty. And I want to meet your kids. And when they build big, big companies, I will only ask for five percent of their companies. All right. And let's do uh, it. Well, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But no, <laughs> seriously, I want to connect with your audience. And so capitalistbook.com is the way to do that. And I just want to say I'm so thankful for you to have me on. You're very picky and it means a lot to me. So I appreciate it. No, we appreciate you sharing all this information and not hiding the ball like some other people do and being willing to be <laughs> bold enough to share not just strategy, but even the things that you did, the evidence of your own life and the fruit thereof. So I really appreciate you making time to come on the show today. Talit, thank you so much. Tell Ty and the kids hi for me, okay? All right, will do. Thank you.